his ability to outwork everybody else is what won him five championships. Sure. Well, I mean, think of how many other guys are extremely gifted from an athletic perspective when they go into, you name the sport, but never reach that because they didn't find that work. level because they get there and it's like the end all be all like they've made it. And then they start to rest on their laurels yeah. and they never really develop into their full potential. This is the B1 Change 1 podcast, where our mission is to help listeners to find values, practice integrity, and inspire change. Our vision is to mentor men and empower them to achieve more by taking responsibility for shaping their own lives. He's Cass, an evolving man who has been shaped by adversity and continues to grow through his imperfections. And he's Roscoe, an imperfect work in progress that tries to suck less every day. Between us, we have over 40 years of Air Force fighter pilot experience with countless hours as trainers, instructors, and mentors. Join us and learn to take responsibility for your own life as we dive into subjects from leadership to resilience to vulnerability. Be the one who changes their course. Be decisive, driven, and purposeful. Set the example for others. Lead. We wish we'd had this show when we were younger men. Be the one. I just started watching this series on uh, on Netflix called Swamp Kings, and it's all about the late 2000 single digits, early 2010s Florida Gators. Tim Tebow, Urban Meyer, you know, that whole group that was down there, and they won some championships. They did a lot of really good work, and that was one of the things that stands out. And Tim Tebow is one of those guys where he just he stands on attitude and effort because those two things are 100% in your control. And you can always bring them at a high level. Yeah. Did you ever fly with the French? Like no. at a NATO exercise or no. a flag? Well, okay. I went to a French tanker one time. That's a whole other story. Well, here's the here's the parallel in the fighter community. So I, I had a couple of, one red flag, one maple flag, where we had the French there. And I remember one night at the O Club at Nellis, I was talking to one of the Mirage pilots. Mm-hmm. And in their Air Force to become a fighter pilot and then to get selected to fly the Mirage 2000, that's it. That's the pinnacle. And so those guys get there and they're done and they're done. Yeah. And they suck like suck, like on the egress in the wrong block, almost having midairs with other Mm. aircraft, right? Because they're not adhering to block adherence for deconfliction. I mean, just simple, simple fighter pilot things, right? Yeah. Not to mention that their tactics were completely horrible, but (laughs) yeah, like, but that's the difference, right? And that's that mindset difference that we're talking about. Uh, And let me, let me read this one quote real quick from, uh, from Tim Tebow, because I mean, uh, and I keep, I keep saying his name. I've brought his name up a few times, but like it or not, the dude's an upstanding human being. Uh, We can argue his, his professional choices once he decided he was going to go to the NFL. We can argue that at another time, which I think is a, a good fun discussion, but I think he's a good guy. And I'm going to read this quote. We can control a few things, our attitude, our effort, our focus, and how we go about treating our teammates, Tim Tebow. And I think that leads in nicely to what we were going to try to talk about today. Things that don't take any talent. We did an episode previously a few weeks ago that we were talking about how to get ahead in the workplace. If that was one of your questions, if that episode left you kind of wondering or on your on the edge of your seat, this is the one you need to listen to because these are the things that can separate you from the herd. Absolutely. And I think what's important to understand too is these things that we're talking about, they don't require talent. They they are skills. They do require maybe a little discipline. Yeah. And they definitely require maybe a little self awareness. You have to develop them to a certain extent. You do. Yeah. But they're easy. Right. And you don't have to have talent in any of these right. things in order to be able to execute them. None of this shit. It doesn't matter if you can run a six minute mile. Yeah. Or if you can bench press 300 pounds. Yeah. Or if you're super or, great at organization or planning or anything exactly. like that. If you have a 200 IQ, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Right. These are things that you can develop over time with a little bit of, well, with a little bit of effort. Effort. Yeah. yeah. And a go. little bit of discipline. Yeah. So what's, what's, uh, what's something you know, if I'm, let's say I'm a young man and I just got a new job and what's something I can start doing right off the bat that doesn't take any talent. And I, maybe I don't even know what the job really is yet. I have to learn that piece of it, but what's a couple of things that I can do to separate 
just immediately start separating myself from my peers. Be on time. Yep. And one thing that we learned in the military is 10 minutes early is on time. On time is late. Yep. Yep. And on time is late. That's right. And so, because when we start briefs, it's three, two, one hack, the door Door closes. Door slams. And you're not taking your seat at that point. You know, you need to be there That's five, right. 10 minutes early. You need to get all your stuff in order, be ready and prepared for the brief to start. Having pissed. Yeah. Having eaten. Gotten have, your have coffee. Your, have your dip of skull already yeah, in. Right. You know, like, yeah. You got to be ready to go. Yep. And so, because there's no getting up once it starts That's right. and going out because you forgot something. So you need to make sure that all your stuff's in order. So be early, right? Yeah. Not even early. 10 minutes early is on time. Like just get that into your head right now. It, you know, it, it always cracks me up and we see it with our kids. Here's one thing you can do. If you're the kind of cat who you have your alarm set, you wake up and you hit snooze five times, knock it off. When your alarm goes off, mm. get up. Get out of bed. Start your day, right? That's right. And, you know, because, and here's the deal. If, if you're one of those people that can hit the, the snooze button five times and you're still showing up 10 minutes early, then set your alarm where that fifth snooze would get end. Get 30 minutes And get that extra, yeah. you know, but if you're, if you're making yourself late because you're laying in bed for an extra 10 minutes, that 10 minutes isn't going to make a difference for your day. Yeah. Well, there's some, there's some actual no kidding studies on when you hit the snooze button, what it does to your body and your brain, and then you kind of doze back off and you hear that alarm for the second time and what that does to your body and your brain. And it actually starts you in a little bit of a deficit. If you do that, if you need an extra 10 minutes of sleep, just set your alarm 10 minutes later. You'd be better off staying in the sleep that you're already in and having that alarm go off at maybe 610 instead of 0600 and hitting the snooze button because it effectively, like your brain gets confused and it kind of goes into this like dormant state. And God, I mean, I'm not a doctor, man, and I don't understand this shit really, but I, I read something about it a while back in a, in a really cool book, Grit by Angela Duckworth. But another piece to, well, along those lines, what you're talking about, that comes down to discipline. When your alarm goes off, you don't hit the snooze button, your feet hit the floor. That's the difference, right? When the alarm goes off, feet hit the floor. That's called discipline. Also something that takes zero talent. You can make a choice to do the things that you said you're going to do. If you said you're going to get up at 0600, when your alarm goes off, get the fuck out of bed, man. Yeah. And they say it takes like four to six weeks to, to turn something into a habit. Into a habit. So yeah. if, you, if you're in the habit of doing that stuff... It's going to suck at first. It's going to be hard to do maybe at first. But once you get your body set to that battle rhythm, it becomes easier and easier. So just get up, be early. I mean, anybody that's in management or leadership or anything like that, like you see those things, yeah. especially over time. So if, if, if you've got the cat that walks in every day five minutes late and is a little bit disheveled and it takes him an hour to get going in the morning, you recognize that over time. Yeah. If there's the guy that's already at his desk – and he's tapping away and doing his work, or whatever the case may be, you also recognize that. And when it comes yeah. time for promotion or to give somebody an opportunity, who are you going to pick? Right. Well, I would say to a young guy, too, who's you know maybe trying to figure this stuff out, if, if you're that dude who shows up all disheveled, like you said, I, I, I can tell you this from being in leadership positions. I can tell you this from a coach's point of view. I can tell you this from being a father. Dude, we notice that stuff. Yeah. We see it. We may not say something every single time to you, but we're making these silent little notes in the back of our mind, right? And go back to that episode where we were talking about setting yourself apart from your peers, and we talked about the passive guys and and the aggressive dudes and the assertive dudes. You don't want to be that guy where your boss has like this long list of little, little silent notes in his mind about all the things that you fucked up. Things like your pants aren't pressed. That doesn't take any talent. Your shirt's all wrinkled. That doesn't take any talent. You didn't shave for three days. That doesn't take any talent. You know, so so when we're talking about this episode specifically is things that require zero talent. You don't have to be a talented person to get a damn haircut, man. Yeah, and we're going to talk about 10 things specifically, and the first one's being on time. And what I'll just add to what you just said, Roscoe, is if you show up like that or you consistently do things like that, it projects to the world around you that you don't have a lot of respect for yourself. And if you don't have a lot of respect for yourself, you can't really expect other people to have respect for you. That's 100% valid, man. 100% valid. And, and there's a, a really cool thing that I read in, in another book called um, 
success is a choice. And he talks about self-esteem. And, and when it comes to self-esteem, we're not just talking about feeling really good about yourself. We're talking about putting in the effort so that you deserve whatever it is you're trying to get. And, and in his case, he was talking about sports and, and trying to win championships. But if you don't do the work, if you don't put forth the effort, then you don't deserve the win. And at the end of the day, if you do win, I'm not going to say you shouldn't feel good about it, but you should look at yourself in the mirror and know that you could have done even more. Like if you beat the team by two points, maybe next time you could beat them by 10. If you just do the freaking work, right? And take that same attitude into the workplace. If you don't groom yourself and dress for the job that you want and come to work prepared every day on time or early and things like that, then you don't deserve the promotion, man. You you just don't deserve it. And from a boss's perspective, from a leader's perspective, I'm not going to pick you. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. So it matters, right? So take a little pride in yourself. That doesn't mean be prideful necessarily, but take a little pride in yourself and how you show up and what you look like and how you present yourself because it matters. Other people notice, yeah. other people look at that. It's like Dion used to say, right? Look good, feel good, feel good, play good, play good, yeah. pay good, right? There that, go. There's truth in that. There so, Yeah. He's uh he's kicking ass over at Colorado, man. Yeah, he's he really, sure is. He's really setting a whole new culture over there. And I mean, that guy's, he's got a tremendous level of confidence yeah, for right. one, you know, he's very confident in himself and, and, Borderline cocky, but so was Robin Olds, man. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Oh, well, he's a good leader. Yeah. He knows how to motivate. I think so. Okay. So what's number two then? So if we're just going to go down the list, then how about work ethic? Yeah. Let's start just, there. Just from a, just from a, uh, an effort standpoint and, and I'll go ahead and spoil it too. Number three is effort, but these two go hand in hand from a work ethic standpoint. You don't quit until the job's done. You show up when you're required to show up. This is this is something, too, that I, I think kind of falls in line with it, and I tell this story a lot to kids. I think that something that speaks to your character is if you're the kind of guy walking through the hallway and you see a piece of trash on the floor, do you stop and you pick it up? Or do you just walk past it? Are you the kind of dude who's going to empty the shredder when nobody asked? You know, those are little things that, that people notice. That doing things that aren't necessarily in your job description, but go a long way when you're trying to win brownie points for your for your manager and your boss. Yeah, and a lot of this stuff, realize too, is an aggregate, right? So if you are doing these things, you have to be consistent in this. It's not doing it once. It's not, I'm going to be on time once, or I'm going to show great effort once. Or yeah. it's That's not what gets you noticed. What gets you noticed is when it's consistent and that that ethic is consistently yeah. strong. And you're consistently outperforming the people around you or you're getting things in ahead of time, Mm -hmm. you know, at a higher rate than the folks around you are. I mean, we have so much construction going on around us right now where we live. And I I don't know a lot about construction, but one thing that always cracks me up is, you know, you be driving down the road and there's five dudes in an orange with orange vests on and four of them are standing around watching one dude with a (laughs) pickaxe. It's just swinging away like crazy. And I always drive by that and I giggle to myself and I'm like, well, it's either four supervisors like, or maybe the dudes in training. I don't know. There's probably a reason. Maybe they're tagging out because they're tired. But if I'm there, I'm like, that's the guy I want on my team. That dude with the pickaxe in his hand, not the four dudes that are over there smoking and joking. Yeah. Let me, let me, let me push back on just one thing that you said there. And you said outperforming. And I don't know if that's a, a, a direct line of parallel when we're talking about just work ethic, because the people that you're, I don't know, I dare say competing with or working with, they maybe just have more experience than you. True. Um, so you may not be able to outperform them at the stage that you're in. I mean, if you're the new guy at work and it's your first day, you're probably not going to outperform the guy who's been there for a couple of years. You know what I mean? So outperforming may be just a slight misspeak. And yeah, it was. When we're talking outwork about outworking. Is or, what I meant. Yeah, out, you can outwork the guy or at least at least keep up and, and be comparable to him. And, and also lean on that guy and ask questions and learn from that dude so that you can eventually outperform him and get that promotion. Yeah, agreed. What about, uh, well, going into effort, you know, and, and work ethic and effort kind of, kind of go hand in hand, but just from an effort standpoint, I've got my own stories of that just very recently about you got to do the work, man. And if you don't do the work, then you don't deserve victory. If it, if it means a 20 hour day, you put in a 20 hour day, you know, you, you just got to get the shit done. Yeah. So share that. Talking specifically about the podcast and the, and the book, trying to get those things launched and a lot of other personal 
personal things going on in my life, trying to juggle all those things, there's still only 24 hours in a day, man. And Jocko Willink has a cool book called Discipline Equals Freedom. And one of the things that he talks about in his, in his book is if you want more time in your day, if you want more freedom, then get up earlier in the morning. Get, get up at 4, get up at 4.30, get your workout done, start your day with a win, you know, and, and, and get your ball rolling. And then that opens up more time in your day to be able to do these other things. Some of these high performers that we look at, some of these, these high-level business owners, CEOs, these very successful people, they talk about breaking their day up into three six-hour chunks. So they're getting three work days in one day. Whereas a lot of people get up, they go work their eight hours at work, they come home. Well, who's going to win in the long run, right? Yeah, dude, that's just that's effort. That's, yeah, they're that's just totally getting up and they're 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 compartmentalizing things. They're breaking up their days. They're organizing. Oh, by the way, none of those things take talent. Yeah, none of them take talent. But just down to the effort piece of it, you know, if you've got a list of a hundred things that you've got to get done today, how do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. Start taking those bites, man. Start knocking down those dominoes and don't stop until it's done. And if it means 20 hours, it means 20 hours. You go get some rest, you get up and do it again. Yeah, and maximum effort to, again, it goes back to, it does require some development of skill, right? I think one thing that can help you become good at effort or maximizing effort is to become really good at time management. Yeah, organize. Yeah. And so organizing yourself in... When I was younger, I used to do this. I used to do what you were talking about. I used to break up my day, especially when I was a young fighter pilot, and I needed a lot of time to study yeah. and to to understand the tactics and to spend a specific amount of time each week working on certain skills mm -hmm. to develop me overall as a fighter pilot. But I had a limited amount of time to do that, especially on a fly day, because you know how long the briefs, yep. execution and debriefs go. Then yep. you got all your additional duties and queep that you have to do. And, you know, you've got deadlines for certain things if you're a project officer for something or, you know, plus I got to get home to mom and the kids and how do I, so I would take my day and I go, all right, well, day starts at six. So briefs at nine. So when I get to the squadron from six to seven 30, that's vault time and seven 30 to eight 30 is queep time and eight 30 to nine is prep for the sortie time, you know, and then it's fly, yeah. it's brief fly debrief debrief will probably end let's just say around three o'clock in the afternoon i need to be at x by five so what do i have that to what can i do in that two hour yeah. time frame yeah and just plan it out and then stick to it and that takes a little bit of discipline because there's times at six o'clock in the morning that i didn't necessarily want to go back into the vault and read for an hour and a half or study yeah. for an hour and a half and you get tired you get sleepy and, yeah, and, and you don't you're not motivated i want to go take either. a nap or but you yeah you have to you have it's, there are times where you have to have the discipline mm -hmm. to force yourself to do that because you're not going to see the fruit of it unless you put that time in. Yeah. And so it's not, a, you have to eliminate the, I don't want to piece of your brain, <laughs> right? Because there's going to be a ton of times where you're not going to want to necessarily do the task at hand, but it's a task that needs to be done. It's, it's the same thing you see. I mean, I see it with my kids too. The procrastination piece. Well, why would I do it today? I, I can wait until the last minute to do something. Well, you can, but when you wait until the last minute to do something, what invariably happens is something else pops up and now the amount of time you yeah. thought you were going to have to get something done isn't the amount of time you have anymore. Well, and there's a concept in there though too, man, that's, that's kind of underlying of what you're saying is if you're that guy that procrastinates and does things at the last minute, is that the absolute best product that you could have put forth? Like good enough is not good enough, man. You You should not be... If you finish a project and you say, well, that's good enough, then that means that you could have done better, right? That, that's the translation there. And if you're the kind of dude who waits until the last minute to complete something, then you probably could have done better. How many times have you not procrastinated? You, you lean into something, you got 20 days to, or, or two or three weeks to get this project done. And you lean in in the first two or three days and you get draft one done, all right? I got some great examples about that. I'm holding one of them right now. It's called work hard, don't suck, right? You write the first draft and then you sit on it for a couple of months. Just don't even look at it. And then you come back and reread it and you go, oh my God, that was terrible. And you start, you start editing, you start lining through things. You start making another, another iteration of this project that you're working on. Shelve it for a little bit. Like if you wait until the very last minute, you're going to miss those opportunities to revise and 
that whole analogy of chop it with an axe and then fine tune it with a razor kind of thing. Yeah. You, you miss the opportunity for improvement and to set yourself apart in certain respects. And we saw this in the flying community. I mean, I remember being at a red flag or just in general, guys would be like, well, if you plan early, you plan often. Or you can plan thoroughly. There's a little yeah. truth to that, right? Sure. I can wait until the last two hours and come up with a game plan. Is that game plan going to be, am I going to have the time to think through all the contingencies so that when everything does go to pot at push, yeah. I've already thought about it all and I know exactly and immediately what I'm going to flex to. And you see it fall apart on guys all the time. Mm-hmm. The guys that put it off and oh, I don't need to, you know, we don't need to 12 hours to plan this red flag, blah, blah, blah. You know, and then you out there and their execution is piss poor as opposed to if they would have just put the effort in, it would have been a really, they probably could have come up with a really good game plan. I saw it at Naval Post Graduate School too, because at the end of every, we'd have four classes a quarter. And at the end of every quarter, our finals were typically like 20 to 30 page research papers, but we would get our subjects at the beginning of the quarter. Mm -hmm. And so by the time we got to the end of the quarter, I usually had two or three of my papers I'm pretty much done. I would start with whatever I thought was kind of the easiest one, write that at the beginning of the term. And then I had time to kind of fine tune it. And then I'd start the second one. Yeah. And I was very disciplined about that. I had a lot of guys in my class that would wait until like the last two, three weeks of the quarter. And now all of a sudden they've got 120 pages to write and they've got to do research yeah. on four different topics and they're completely flailing, you know, or they're staying up, you know, in those last three weeks, 20 hours a day, getting absolutely no sleep. And guess what? The product they put out is nothing close to what it would have been if they would have just taken the time up front to do the work. That's right. Put in the effort, put in the effort early. And and what you're talking about is called Parkinson's law. That's the, the old adage that work will expand to fill the time allowed. So if you can become disciplined about your time management and break up your days, and I got a couple of cool stories I could tell about that, but not only will you find that you end up with more time in the day, but you also will end up with more efficient means and methods that can translate into other projects. You, you, you learn to fine tune these processes early and then it translates later down the road. Yeah. You gain efficiency and then that efficiency will improve your output over time. That's right. And then all of a sudden you're the guy that's turning things in early and has more time available or can take yep. more work on. And guess what? Promotion comes and who, who do you think the boss is going to look for? Yeah. Well, All these things, so far we've talked about them all. Uh, No talent required here. Just a little bit of organization and some some self-discipline and do the work. Yeah, and develop the skill. All right, so all that being said about effort and work ethic and being on time and all that stuff, what's some other things that I can do to that don't take any talent that can help me discriminate myself from others? Another thing you can do is just have a little awareness around your body language. Mm-hmm. So if you're the guy in the meetings who's constantly sighing out loud and rolling your eyes when the boss is talking, probably not the best way to approach it, right? There's probably some things that you could work on there that don't really require a lot of talent, but just maybe a little awareness. You know, when you're talking to somebody or your boss is talking to you or something like that, like look them in the eye. Pay attention to what they're saying. Ask appropriate questions if you need to, to get clarification but be engaged, right? Yeah. So show up and, and try to have that body language that's engaging. And it's not just about, you know, those little social things and social cues that we all pick up on, but it's also, you know, are you are you the kind of guy that's the gruff kind of guy who shows up to work and everybody's like, oh, don't talk to Cass until Where's he's got his coffee for this. Yeah, work, don't talk yeah. to him for the first two hours. I remember when I was, when I was working at Consolidated Freightways, uh, I was 18 years old, loading trucks from 10 at night until six in the morning. And the senior guys that had been there for a long time worked, they, they had these alleys set up basically. So you had trailers on both sides of this big kind of where long warehouse. And then you would pull stuff off of other trucks. You would palletize it and then you would forklift it down to the truck that it needed to go on. And the guys that were responsible for loading the trucks were some of the more senior guys. Well, there was this one guy in particular who it was like, oh, you, you, you better have the pallet just perfect and you better not screw anything up. And the reason why was because the dude didn't want to have any additional effort, right? He didn't want to have to do anything else. He wanted to be able to just take a pallet loaded on the truck and have everything nice and neat and fit and he wouldn't have to do anything else. And it so it was like, oh, avoid him. You know, don't have to take something down, to, especially yeah. if you're new. He's just because he would he would like throw things at people. He's just a total dick, right? So 
don't be that guy. Like, be approachable. Ask appropriate questions. You know, be be nice. Be amenable. Yeah. I think sitting there with your arms crossed, you know, with this... With a scowl on your th- face. Yeah, this, this look on your face like there's a million other places you'd rather be. And and maybe that's true, but I'm, I'm telling you, people notice. These bosses notice, managers notice. And, and I can notice last year, sitting in the football stands, watching high school football, I would I would take a picture of the scoreboard when I thought the game was lost. And usually it was probably in the first or second quarter when the other team scored a touchdown. And I could look at the body language of the players on our sideline and I would watch all their heads go down. Thump. I would watch their shoulders slump. And I'd take a picture of the scoreboard and I'd show Katie, I'd go, yeah, we just lost the game right there. Ten minutes into the first quarter, we lost the game. And I could tell it because of their body language. Because you don't realize a lot of times that your body language, not only does it reflect what you're actually thinking, it's it's subconscious a lot of times, but it can it can project your future outputs as well. If you're the kind of guy who walks around with a scowl on your face, then you're probably a grumpy dude, you know? Whereas if you walk around with a smile on your face, you're probably going to be a happy guy. Yeah. And, and and sometimes you have to force that shit, man. Like this week has been a really good, we, we talked about the buzzsaw of life the other day. This week has been a buzzsaw for me. I've been getting kicked in the nuts for about seven days straight. And sometimes I have to force that smile. And, and no kidding, it, driving in my truck, force myself to smile and say out loud, choose to be happy. Choose to be happy. Doesn't take any talent. You just have to have the mindset to be able to do those things. Well, and that's part of resiliency, which we'll talk about hopefully in the next episode too, I think, is that mindset mm-hmm. that you're getting at. And what I want to be, what I want to make sure we're clear about is I'm not suggesting that you be fake or not be who you are Valid. or show up to work, you know, Valid. and pretend like everything's okay. Because there's times where things are hard and there may mm-hmm. be outside influences, things that are going on at home, relationships, things like that, that are affecting your mood. And But that's a good time to be aware of how those things are affecting what you're projecting out in yeah. other environments that could have a negative impact on what you're trying to accomplish or achieve. And so if you're in that situation, one of the other things you can do is if you've, if you've recognized that there's some outside influences that are driving kind of that outward reflection or behavior or body language in your work environment and it's not intended, pull your boss aside and go, hey, I'm sorry if I'm coming across this way. Yeah. I'm not I'm not upset or frustrated at anything going on at work. I just got some things going on yeah. in my personal life right now that are kind of weighing on me. And sometimes I just, you have a shitty day. Yeah. yeah. And sometimes you sometimes you do. Sometimes you just have a shitty day. But it's yeah. just something to be aware of. Yeah. And it's so, more for if you're just that guy that's always got his arms crossed and a scowl on the face. Well just realize that that's the image that you're projecting out through body language to the, the people around you, your peers, your supervisors, and people take notice. Yeah, well, oftentimes it'll give you, it'll give people a glimpse into what's actually going on in your brain. And I'll give you an example. This week, just this past week, I think it was Thursday morning, Caleb texted me and said, hey, we did our, we, we did PT runs again today. And we ran like a mile and a half or whatever, real slow pace. And then we were doing 400 meter sprints and he won the first, he won the first sprint and then they were getting ready to do another one. And the flight commander says, Hey, if anybody beats me on this one, I guess the flight commander is like his real fit dude. He says, if anybody beats me on this one, I'll give you a high five. So Caleb sprinted out, you know, and, and gets like a 15 meter lead on this dude. And the, and the dude starts talking shit behind him. You know, you better run, White. Yeah, I'm going to catch you. You're going to burn out and all this. And so Caleb said, he said, I don't know what happened, but like a fire got lit. And I just turned on the jets. And he ends up in the grass, like almost dead at the end. But he beat the dude by like 70 meters or something. It like really embarrassed the kid, right? So he goes up to him afterwards, and he stands right in front of him, stands at attention and says, Captain Cadet, whatever your name is, Johnson, my high five, please. And the guy turns around real smug, you know, and he gives him his high five. All right, so break, break, fast forward later that afternoon was their first real formal feedbacks of the ROTC program. They've been up there a couple of weeks and their flight commanders are going to sit them down and give them their kind of their first feedback on 
things that they've noticed, things that they think they can work on and whatever. And I think generally speaking, people fall into categories. Like if you're a top third performer, you probably know that you're a top third performer. If you're a bottom third performer, you probably know that you're a bottom third performer. But if you're in that middle third, you may have some questions. You may wonder, well, where am I? How am I doing? You know, and anyway, so Caleb walks in, he, he does his reporting statement or whatever, and they tell him to sit and he's chilling. And they debriefed him on his body language. For the first few days, they're doing these goofy exercises. You know, I mean, all these kids are new to this and, and all these people are away from home for the first time. And many of them have not been exposed to any kind of military structure or anything. And Caleb's sitting there, kicked back, slouching in his chair with his arms crossed like he's bored to shit, you know, because he grew up in a military family and he's been around fighter pilots his whole life. And I mean, he just has a different attitude going into different this. Perspective. You know? He does. He, he, he knows what he has to do. He, I've coached him well. He knows the steps that he's got to take to be able to win. And he knows the things that he's going to have to accomplish and the hard work that he's going to have to do to get into that fighter cockpit here in a few years. These other kids don't know that. So when Caleb's sitting there slouching his seat with his arms crossed, looking like he's got a thousand other places he'd rather be, which may be true, the flight commanders picked up on that and they debriefed him on that. So just take that as a as, as kind of you know walking away from this discussion about body language. People notice this shit, man. Yeah, Coaches notice. You, your superiors notice. Your your leaders notice. Your manager. All these people. If you're the kind of guy that's putting off this body language, it's gonna it's gonna discriminate you from someone else at some point. Absolutely. What else? What All else right, can we next, do? Next is energy. Yeah, well, that kind of goes into the work ethic and the and the, and effort, the effort, right? Bringing yeah. bringing energy and a good attitude. Yep, just yeah. bring good energy to every day. Like even if some again, it's it goes back to what we were talking about before. There were a lot of times where I didn't feel motivated or feel like I had the energy to sit in the vault and study. Yeah, and to put that time in. But you have to put the time in. Yeah. And you got to put the energy into it and you got to put the effort into it. And well, so, how about, how about looking at energy from maybe a slightly different perspective and not like, you know, how a battery has energy and are you charged or are you not charged, but how about the energy that you're putting out into the universe? You know, if you want to go straight up woo woo on the things, let's look at some Nikolai Tesla stuff and talk about energy and frequency and vibration and that kind of shit, right? If you put out good positive energy, Guess what's going to be reciprocated back to you? Get that that energy is going to be reflected back. If you walk around your workplace scowling and frowning all day, what are other people going to do? Versus if you walk around and you have a smile on your face and you walk up to people and say hello and and you're polite and you're putting out good positive energy, that will be reciprocated to you and it makes yeah, everybody feel point. better. Yeah, that's a great. You know, point. and and that also will be reflected on you when it comes time for your feedback. People. People will want to be around you. Want to work with you. Exactly. You know, who wouldn't want you on their team? Even if you're not the highest performer, even if you're not the maybe the best person for that job, if you're the kind of guy that makes the the rest of the if you're the cheerleader for the team, then hell yeah, I want you on my team, man. I'll find a role for you, even if it's just going to get in coffee. And if you are put in the role of going to get in coffee, be the best coffee getter ever. Yeah, well, and that goes to what we were talking about a little bit earlier, and I'll use a guy for on the Seahawks because I'm a huge Seahawks fan, and football starts tomorrow. Go Hawks! Um, but there's a, an undrafted wide receiver uh, that got made the 53 man roster for the Seahawks. His name's Jake Bobo. He ran a four nine forty at the combine. That's not fast. Not fast at all. <laughs> Hence, well, it's faster than me. Yeah, but it's not fast compared to four receivers. Yeah. right? Hence, undrafted. But the dude just has a knack, great route runner, and he's got a great sense of the field, and he kind of knows where to maneuver and put himself in space to just be open. Yeah, and it showed in the preseason. And I mean, DK Metcalf, who is you know arguably one of the best receivers, top ten at least in the NFL, uh, did an interview the other day, and he's like, his energy and the effort that he puts in, the attention to detail that he yeah. has, he goes he he's teaching me things like he got DK is so naturally gifted that he doesn't focus on some of the things that Jake Bobo has yeah. to, but, but the cool thing about Bobo is Bobo knows what his weaknesses are. Yeah. And so he, he, he uses that to figure out and put effort into what can be his strengths. So he knows he's not going to burn a guy down the sideline for a touchdown. Mm -hmm. So he has to figure out 
based on the route tree and the structure of the game plan and the defense that they're running, where's the soft spots going to be? Yeah. Where, how do I, where, where can I leverage this? Where am yeah. I going to move? What move am I going to make to put myself in this spot on the field where I know I'm going to yeah. be between the safety and the cornerback with a little bit of room on either side for Gino to give me the ball. And he, yeah. and he made the team, man. Well, I'm going to, you know, we've kind of got a list that we're looking at here and, and uh, I'm going to skip down the list just a little bit and talk about preparation what you're talking about is preparation. The guy understands his strengths and weaknesses and he's learning how to leverage those. Yeah. And, and part of that is preparing so that when you show up on Sunday, you go up to the line of scrimmage, you got the play call and maybe it's an option route for him, right? Maybe he's, uh, he's the three receiver and he's got an option route on the, on the cold side and he can look at the defense and see what coverage is there in and then see the grass around that and know what route he's going to run. So that comes down to preparation, and, and, and you were kind of getting to it earlier when you talked about us going to the flight briefs and everything and being five minutes early, having had, being prepared. I got all my products there. My pen is out. It's ready to go. Three, two, one, hack, door closes, right? Well, everything that led up to that point, that's all preparation. You were, you were talking about, you know, you take the 30 minutes or whatever before the brief. To, you got to get your mind right. You got to get your body right. You got to go drop a deuce, get your coffee, get your breakfast if you need to. You know, make sure your bladder is empty because you're sitting in that room for 65 minutes and yeah. it is 65 minutes of a fire hose that you better be fucking engaged. Are you going to miss what formation we're going to be so in? And then the whole thing's going to... So yeah, there's a lot of detail, but that preparation that you do on the front end is what gets you to the point where you can execute on the back end, yeah. right? So the things that you're talking about, about the receiver, he's going to he's gonna fix all that shit in the film room. Yeah. That's that. He's not fixing that on the field on Sundays. He's fixing that Monday through Thursday in the film room. Yeah, I used to teach guys when they were coming up in the fighter squadrons, like separations in the preparation. If you do the time to do the mission planning, if you do the time to do the route study, if if you memorize the target area photo yeah, so that when you're in the targeting pod, you're not having to go back and forth between your knee board and the pictures you have mm-hmm. because you ended up threat reacting and now you're coming in 180 degrees out and the picture in the targeting pod looks, or 90 degrees out and the picture in the targeting pod that you were expecting to see is completely different than what you're seeing. Yep. You know, or you've got a really difficult target that you've got to pull out because there's multiple targets around it or something like that. Like that's the that's the preparation yeah. piece. And we, that's what will separate you and your performance. We used to have to do radar predictions. So we take these low level, uh, low altitude radar pictures of the targets that we were going to go hit. And with the shading and all that, how the radar energy is reflected and all that, it gives you a picture. And we would have to, on a blank piece of paper, we would have to draw out the radar prediction of what we thought it was going to look like based on the altitude and the graze angles and the ranges and all that stuff. And I used to do this to my to my students as well. We, you know, you brief this whole thing up and, and dude, when you're a student, you're just, you're hanging on. You're, you're hanging on for like these, these key phrases and these key moments and you're trying to write everything down and soak as much stuff as you can in. Well, one of the things that I would do to them I did this in the 425th a few times. Go to the ops desk, got all your gear on and everything. Everybody pulls out their lineup card and they're getting ready to get the lineup. You're getting ready to step. And I would walk around to the printer, take out a blank piece of paper and walk up to the student and say, draw your target. Draw your target north up. Let's go. I wanted to see if you had actually internalized everything that was just briefed to you. And sometimes I'd throw them for a loop and I'd, I'd put that same piece of paper in front of them and say, draw my target. Yeah. So I need you paying attention, man, to everything, yeah. right? And there, I mean, there's a lot that goes into this, but if you do the right preparation, then yeah, dude, whatever. I'll draw you a cool, quick little stick drawing. Here's a road over here. Here's the building, and my building's over here, and you're going to hit something over there, you know, whatever. Right. Um, maybe not to the level of detail that I would understand my target, but you at least generally understand where my target is and what it is. Because what happens if my bombs don't work? I'm going to call on you, buddy. Get in there and kill it. Absolutely. Cool. All right, you want to talk about uh, next is attitude, so positive mm. mental attitude. We've talked about this a few times on the podcast already, yeah. but I'll let you lead. Yeah, my, you know, my big three, man, attitude, attention, and effort. And attitude was, it was listed first for a reason. I need you to have a good attitude when you come to work. And this goes back to the body language and, and all these things that we're talking about. But all these things tie together they like do. they always and do when we talk about this stuff on the podcast. Hearing a lot of redundancy, but your attitude is, you, your attitude's going to separate you, man. If you come in with a good attitude, then that opens you up to instruction. It opens you up to coaching. It opens you up to the idea that maybe you ain't all that in a bag of potato chips. And that, that'll funnel down into a little humility and, and things like that. But having a good attitude 
projects to to the other people that you're you're there because you want to be there. You're not there because you have to be. And I know some of you guys out there listening are probably working jobs that you don't like right now. You can still use this as stepping stones. You can use this as a as a method to gain some perspective on maybe what you don't like. You know, and I gave the example a few episodes ago about growing up on a cotton farm. I knew 100% I did not want to be a cotton farmer. Process of elimination, man. So the the point with the attitude is if you go into it with a decent attitude, you can still pick out the good things that are there. And maybe it's not the job that you like, but it's the perspective that you're gaining from the job that you don't like. Maybe, maybe you just came to that realization like, dude, I don't want to pour concrete for the rest of my life. Okay, great. That's a good attitude, man. Have a good attitude about it and start working some side hustle shit to get you to a point where you don't have to pour concrete for the rest of your life. Yeah, what I would say too for for guys that may be in that situation is don't if even if you're getting frustrated, like try not to jump ship unless until you've got something else in line, until you've got <laughs> something else that you can jump to because it may yeah. not be that transition may not be as simple as you think it might be. And also, you never know who's watching. And here's a perfect example. When I was working in politics and on a campaign, you never know who else is paying attention around you that may open up opportunity for you. And so even if you're doing something that maybe you're not really enjoying, if you're showing up with the right work ethic, if you're showing up with the right attitude, there may be somebody else from somewhere else that sees that, that then approaches you and goes, hey, would you, would you be interested in coming over and working for me? I had a I had an opportunity when I was working for the majority web. I had an opportunity to go back and work in D.C. I had a representative in the House of Representatives in Washington D.C. from the state of Washington, who's what do they call him? Chief of Staff had done some work with us. We were working on a particular piece of legislation for our district that his realm of responsibility overlapped with, and so I got to work with their staff a little bit. Well, I had no idea this chief of staff was watching me and appreciated the effort and the attitude yeah. and the work that I did so much that they actually reached out to the person I was working for, this gal named Gigi Talcott, and was like, hey, we'd like to hire him and bring him to D.C. and put him on our staff. Are you okay if we approach him with it? And she was nice enough to, to give me the option anyways and say, sure. You yeah, know. nice. I didn't take the job because I didn't want to move to D.C., but you, my point is is that you just you never know – what other opportunities yeah. you may open up by just doing those things? Because somebody else may see you. Somebody in a different division of the company may see you. You, you just never know. Yeah. Well, well, we'll do another episode at some point about opportunities and what that really means and how do you create opportunities? How do you recognize opportunities? How do you take opportunities? Because it's not just as simple as, like, luck. There's, there's actually some quantifiable things that go into, quote, unquote, luck, you know? timing for sure and just being in the right place at the right time that that may be just kind of luck of the draw sometimes but preparation is a, is a big piece of that you know if you're not I used to I used to tell people you don't always have to be the shiniest penny sometimes you just need to be a penny when they need a penny but dude if you're not a penny you're not going to get chosen if you're not the kind of guy that's done the preparation and done the work and brought those attitudes and brought that energy and brought that effort to work when that opportunity does arise, they're not going to call on you. Yeah. You know, and, and I have a, a an old, my own personal story about when my first flying assignment, uh, I was put into the instructor, I was put in the on-deck circle to be an instructor as a lieutenant. Things were going well. I was being groomed, and I thought that I had my career path laid out in front of me. Well, me and the commander had some disagreements. Our personalities didn't necessarily mesh, and he took me out of that on-deck circle and he put me just as a regular line was O and did not afford me those opportunities that I thought that I was going to be able to go and, and do. So my next assignment comes around and I'm going to go be an air liaison officer. They're taking me out of the cockpit and they're sending me to go pound the ground with these other dudes. And dude, I was really butthurt about that. I was really butthurt. And, and I went through a phase where I blamed a lot of people. It took me a long time to get to the point where I, I recognized that my actions had it put me in that situation, and I, I started to own it. Yeah, and just for clarity, it's just so guys know, like to, to be in the, the on-deck circle as a lieutenant for the instructor pilot upgrade is rare, very rare. I would I would say so. I was very proud and of that. And yeah. if you had gone through the instructor pilot upgrade, you probably wouldn't have gone on to an ALO assignment. 
you probably would have gone that's true. back to the cockpit, right? Would, so that's if, how that also kind of affected yeah. what you did next. Yeah, my, my career trajectory, trajectory that's a hard word for me, it was going to be an ops to ops or an ops to the FTU, um, the, the, the training base at Seymour Johnson or something like that, probably followed by weapon school mm-hmm. and, and those kinds of things. So I was on a good, I thought I was on a good path, man. And I, and I was working hard, you know, and, and luckily for me, I was, I didn't suck at what I did. It was my attitude that was the separator, right? My, my attitude when I came into work every day, my, my commander didn't really care for it too much. And Hey, you know what? I paid the price for my own actions. And I own that. All right. Well, then I went to the next assignment. I went to go be the air liaison officer at Fort Campbell, uh, working with the 101st. And when I first showed up there, I was really butthurt. I was was not happy about not being in the cockpit anymore. I was not happy about going three years with not flying and raging and, and, and all that. And it took me a little bit to regain the perspective. And I remember sitting down with Katie, talking to her about some of this stuff. And, and we, you know, we just had to, we had to, we literally took a piece of paper out and we started writing down all the good stuff about that move back to Tennessee. We're close to Nashville. We've always loved Nashville. It's always had a, a soft spot in our hearts for Nashville. We're closer to family. We were a five hour drive from her parents. That part of the country is just absolutely beautiful. There's lakes everywhere, there's rivers everywhere. It's great fishing. You can go out on the countryside. I mean, so once we started to identify these, all the the things that we really liked about the area and the and the stuff and I mean not to mention the people that I was working with I was working with some hard chargers man like we were pushing it up it was fun we were going out and blowing shit up every day I got to jump out of helicopters I mean I got to go to got to go to the air assault school and then I went back and re- uh, went to the repel master school so I got to do repelling out of helicopters I mean there was a lot of good shit going on and it after a little bit my attitude changed and I started to look at it for what it was and that turned out to be one of my best assignments man I mean, it really set me up to go back into the cockpit with a lot of momentum and a great attitude. Yeah, and more focus. Yeah. Yeah, well, that gratitude's a huge piece of it. Gratitude's a huge piece of resiliency, which we'll talk about in the next episode. Attitude of gratitude, man. All right, the next one's passion. And well, I'll just start here. What, what I'd say about is kind of what we were already alluding to is you may not be passionate about what you're doing, but I think you should be passionate about the work you do. Because it's a reflection of you. It's a reflection of your character. It's a yeah. reflection of how you show up. And so you may not be passionate about what you're doing, but you should still do what you do as well as you can and be passionate about the product that you put forward individually yeah. because that is a direct reflection of you as a person and your character and your work ethic and your effort and your attitude and all of those other pieces that we've already yeah. talked about. Yeah, that personal pride is... That's I think that's a big piece of it, man. And passion's a passion's an interesting one, man, because a, a lot of times passion can't be forced. You know, passion almost in a lot of ways has to come from within. It has to be something that you're interested in. It has to be something that you're willing to give the effort to. And I'll, like if you're pouring concrete and you're not passionate about building shit, I mean, it's going to be very hard for you to be the best concrete pourer on your team. Yeah, You know, you, you kind of have to find something. And this comes through a lot of exploration and trying new things. And uh, like me, I like creating things. I, I really I really enjoy creating the products for the podcast and the videos. And you I like sit that there creative and process. I, I, bre- I brainstorm things. And, and I really enjoy learning the processes of how to do those things. I, ma- I made a quick short video this morning. And it took me like 30 minutes. So I'm, I'm getting a little bit better at it because it's a passion project, right? Some other things, that, you know, not only the, the passion, but you kind of have to be persistent at it. So if you think that you're passionate about one particular thing, like, okay, I'm, I'm passionate about music, for example. I really love music. Music just gets to me in my soul. So I'm going to go buy a guitar. I can tell you from firsthand experience that when you sit down with your guitar for the first time, it's not going to sound like what you think is coming out of the radio, right? Uh, I skipped class in college for three weeks just so I could make three chords on my guitar. It takes a lot of it takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of effort. It takes persistence. And you can't get you can't get wrapped up in this this failure mentality of, well, I can't do it like Stevie Ray Vaughan does it. Dude, Stevie Ray Vaughan is A, he's very talented, but B, he's been working on it since he was like five years old. He's been playing guitar. Yeah. You know, so you, your your first attempt is not gonna sound like like Leonard Skinnerd. 
Yeah, well, and the other thing, just to piggyback on that, is if you do think that you're passionate about something, then look for opportunities in that, and try to try to like you were saying, it's it's an explorative process, right? It's something that we learn over time. But if you if you do know that you're passionate about a certain thing, explore that a little bit, and then see if you can find opportunities in that, and see if yeah. that's really what it is that you're passionate about, or that's the right fit for you, mm-hmm. so that you can step into that and maybe start to do something, you know, from a work perspective that kind of aligns with those things well and give it time and effort that it deserves too right you know you're you're not going to get good at something the first couple of times you try it so and you know there's another trap too Cass. that if you let's say that you make good grades in english in high school if you if you get to this point in your life where you think maybe, maybe you've exhausted a few other job opportunities and you say well i was i was good at english I think I'm going to go be an English major in college. Dude, you could have been good at English because your instructor was a softie. You, it may not be that you were excellent at that one particular thing. It could have been you were just given a layup and you have this perception of awesomeness when really you're not. So the caution there is don't choose something just because you think you might be good at it. Hey, choose it, explore it, but don't be frustrated when it turns out that you really suck at that thing. All right. Find something that you're good at. Find something that you enjoy through trial and error and put a lot of energy into it. Put some effort into it. Be persistent about it. Persevere over those failures that you're going to have. Like I said, I mean, it took me, shit, man, it took me about six months of playing guitar before I could put together my first song. Six freaking months. Yeah. And by the way, here's an aside. If anybody ever tells you that they started playing guitar for a reason other than to pick up chicks, they're lying to you. (laughs) 100% 100% trying to pick up chicks on the front porch of my fraternity house. Other guys were playing guitars. Like, well, shit, I can do that. My grandpa played guitar. It's in my blood somewhere. And it took me a long damn time yeah, to be able to play some of the easiest songs that are out there, you know, Margaritaville or whatever. It's got right. like two chords in it. But anyways, yeah, follow your passions. Don't be frustrated with it. Give it the time that it deserves. Yeah, and then just be passionate about what you do and realize that it's a reflection of you and your character. Yeah. All right, the next one is being coachable. Attitude. Hundred uh, percent growth mindset versus fixed mindset. Bring a good attitude to practice every day or to your job every day. The coachable piece of it, and and I would much rather have somebody who is open to instruction than a know it all any day of the week. Yeah, well, we saw that in fighter squadrons, right? You may have a kid that's really talented, but maybe it has a huge ego on him and doesn't really listen to debriefs. Doesn't think he can be taught anything, you know. And you may have a kid who's Maybe not as talented, but yeah. seeks out feedback, is eager for instruction, is eager to learn, is trying to fix the things that he can and become better. Mm-hmm. Who, who are you going to take? Well, and but the proof comes of that. So we see this in the B course, right? The B course is six to nine months long. These kids come in. They've B never, course is the basic course. Sorry. I need to get better at that. It's where I guys learn that. basically the airframe that they're going to fly if they That's get right. assigned to the F-16 or the F-15, F-22, whatever it yeah. may be. So guys show up. They've never even seen an F-35, right? We put them in, we put them through a set of academics. We put them through some simulators. They go out and they fly some sorties. And about six to nine months later, they're graduating the B course. Well, on the front end of that, when guys first show up, you kind of got two categories. You got the guys who are fixed mindset. You got the guys who are growth mindset. The fixed mindset dudes are probably the guys who graduated top of their class. Flying just really came easy to them. So far, they haven't been super challenged. And then you got the other guys in the growth mindset who had to work their way through flight school. It did not come easy to them. They had to constantly study, and they probably busted a handful of rides and got lucky and got fighters and whatever. All right. Well, those two dudes, when they start out in the B course, it's going to be very easy for the fixed mindset guy at first because it's kind of spoon-fed to you. It's very slow. It's a lot of information, and you still have to do some work. Yeah, but the left-hand, right-hand stuff kind of comes natural to them a little bit. They got great hand-eye coordination. They can process information very quickly. And they kind of coast to a point, right, until we get into the super heavy tactical shit, right? Whereas the growth mindset guy, it's not as easy for him at first. And he has to put in a tremendous amount of work, and he's constantly studying and staying up late and preparing and getting ready for the next day. Well, what happens when you start to get to these super complicated mission sets, right, where now the fixed mindset guy is having to start putting in some work? He's not used to that. Whereas the growth mindset a guy is, and that dude stays on this upward trajectory of just getting better and better and better, where now the fixed mindset a guy is super challenged. And we see those guys kind of get to a plateau 
and they sort of just fizzle yeah. or, or, or they stay there. You know, where these growth mindset guys are the dudes who end up going to weapons school because they're used to the grind. They're used to learning. They're used, they have, they built the habits of studying and preparing and, and putting in all that work. Yeah. They've done the preparation. Yeah, exactly. they, do, they have the, the work ethic, yep. the attitude. <clears throat> those are the dudes that we see more often than not. Those are the dudes that we see climb the ladder up towards being the elite of the elite yeah. versus the fixed mindset of guys who just kind of plateau. Yeah. They kind of plateau and, and they hang out there. They're a decent four ship flight lead. And yeah, that's true. That's very true. Um, and with being coachable too, it's, it's also just about being open to feedback, asking questions, you know, and if you're not getting the feedback you need, go seek it. Yeah. You know, find out, find out how you can improve. Yeah. Talk to your boss about ways to get better, what he needs to see from you that may be different you're not aware of if you're not getting that direct feedback and and if you get feedback take it yeah you know make your adjustments don't sit there and go oh this guy doesn't know what he's talking about blah 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 blah. that's a shitty attitude that's a shitty attitude so yeah i was having this conversation with caleb on the phone the other night he called me after his after his feedback i said dude there it you need to get used to it first if you want to go into the fighter world then you just gotta get used used to get you gotta get used to the (laughs) feedback bro because it's like every hour of every day you're gonna be told that you're fucking something up right it's not always nice this corn doesn't have enough salt on it i I had this one old crusty lieutenant colonel when i was the snacko i was as the snacko you're a young lieutenant in the squadron and your only purpose in life is to make coffee and popcorn right and make sure that the bar is stocked and this one old crusty lieutenant colonel who never wore an undershirt always had his chest hair popping out he would come in and he'd start bitching. He would find something like, there's not enough ketchup in this bottle. You know, he'd go root through the fridge. And hey, anyways, it's frustrating. You take your lumps. But my my coaching piece back to Caleb, again, that, that top third, middle third, bottom third, you kind of know where you fall along this. And if you're a top third kind of guy, yeah, they may be nitpicky. You know, I used to tell my crew chief buddies that if they're bitching about which side of my body I'm wearing my line badge, that means we're doing some good shit. We're not crashing airplanes. Right. Right. If it's nitpicky like that, take it for what it is. Try to make some improvements. You know, in Caleb's case, improve your body language a little bit. Try to be happy and and just move with it. Yeah, and there is, when I say the feedback piece too, if I'm honest with guys, kind of what you're alluding to is when you've been doing something long enough, squadron's a perfect example as well. You know the IPs to take feedback from the instructors that yeah. you're going to listen to, it's and you know the guys. Source, yeah, and you know the guys who you're going to have good body language with, and you're going to give them your attention. But you you may not take everything that they're giving you as feedback yeah. to the same level that you would somebody else. Yeah. So consider there is the some of that. You know, you do have to consider the source. Yeah. But the bottom line is be coachable. Like don't have a don't don't get the big ego. Be Bob. You know, take the take the input, take the advice, make the adjustments you can, press, move forward, keep keep getting better. Yeah. We were talking you know, we we kind of made some comments earlier that I almost I was gonna throw it out then, but I, I'm I'm glad I saved it till now because now we have we've kind of got the comprehensive list down. Well, I say comprehensive. We listed some things and there's a lot more that goes into it. But I wanted to talk just for a second about the the how do you do this? How do you how do you get to be this person that can balance all these things, right? And there's a couple of really good books out there that I recommend to anybody. One of them is Atomic Habits by James Clear. And the other one is Badass Habits by Jen Sincero. And they kind of say the same things, but they say them in two very different styles. One's very academic and one's very laid back. So whichever your style is, go pick up one of those books and cruise through it. And the idea is, you remember back in flight school where we learned the 60 to 1 rule? Mm-hmm. Where the, the analogy goes like this. Like if I tell a guy to fly a heading of 360, which is due north... And he flies a heading of 359. That's only one degree of separation, right? Which doesn't seem like a whole lot. After 60 miles, that guy's going to be one mile off course. What's the point, Roscoe? The point is these small incremental changes that you do, setting your alarm clock five minutes earlier, getting your hair cut on Sundays, you know, things like that. Those little things add up over time. And eventually you start to build new habits and it just becomes second nature to you. And you can build on those, right? If your goal is to learn how to play the guitar like Steve Ray Vaughn, well, you start these incremental habits like I'm going to practice five days a week for 30 minutes a day and make that a habit. And then maybe that grows to 40 minutes a day and maybe it grows to an hour a day or six days a week. And and that's how you build on these things. And, and so you don't have to do everything today all at once. Just set your alarm clock five minutes earlier. 
that gave you five minutes more of your time or five minutes more in your day to where you go make your coffee and now maybe you can meditate for five minutes or you can visualize what you're going to do for that day in that five minutes, figure out a way to, to use that to your advantage. And then that five minutes turns to 10 to 15 to 30. Yeah. And as you go through those things and those things start to become habits, well, what that does is it opens up more space for you to start working on other things that need to become habits. Yeah. Because like you said, those things become second nature. So you're almost by default automatically doing mm-hmm. those things now anyways. And now you can start to move forward on yeah. other things. And and it is, it's an aggregate process and it takes time and it takes a little bit of discipline and persistence. But as you do that over time, you'll start to see the fruits of it for sure. Yeah, absolutely. There's a great movie out there called Brittany Runs a Marathon. And she, I don't, I forget exactly how she got talked into this, but she got talked into running a marathon. And, and if anybody's looking to do something that's very large and very daunting like that, some advice that I got a long time ago was sign up for it and tell everybody that you're going to do it because they'll help hold you accountable for that. They'll, they'll, and it won't come in the form of like, get your ass to the gym. It'll come in the form of like, Hey man, how's your training going for the marathon? You know, and that'll be your little reminder. Like, Oh shit. Yeah. I probably need to get to the gym. Probably need to well, run. Brittany runs a marathon. She she gets up and she's kind of this big old fat chick, right? And she gets up and she puts all of her running gear on and everything. And she sets out and she goes, I'm going to go run a mile. And she made it like a hundred yards and then she's winded and she's doubled over. Well, she learned a very good lesson there about how these are, these are building They're incremental it, steps, it's incremental steps, man. You run a hundred yards today, you run 200 tomorrow. You know, I, I told you my story a while back about putting together, running from one tree to the next tree. You know, it's a couple hundred yards. Yeah. And in six months I ran a half marathon. Right. Like you, these, these are, it's just small incremental changes, man. You're not going to walk out your front door and go run a marathon tomorrow, but you can start now and maybe in six months you can. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. The last one is doing extra. And <laughs> what I'll say to that is, well, some of what we're talking yeah. about is the extra piece of it. Just taking these things, small incremental steps, developing new habits, making yourself better, improving mm-hmm. over time. But what if you're one of those guys in the, so you talked about top third, middle third, bottom third. What if you're one of those guys in the top third? How do you do extra in that case? Like you're already being recognized. You're already, well, here's what I would say. If you're a guy that's in the top third, if you want to do a little extra, maybe it's not, hey boss, I've got more time. You want to give me something else to do? Maybe it's grab one of those bottom third guys and show them how to move up. Check. Show them how to get better, right? We used to focus in the squadron. One of the best things one of my squadron commanders ever did, we went through this 78th closed down, 55th opened up. It was a big fiasco. I won't even go into the story. We get down to the 55th, new squadron commander. He calls all the flight commanders in, goes, I want you to rank every dude in here, pilot, how they fly, officership, you know, how they do on the queep. Those are the three factors. I want you to rank. I want you guys to sit down and rank every dude in this squadron from 1 to 32. So all the flight commanders go back. They come up with their ranking. They meet the next week. They go through it. They talk about everybody, mm-hmm. strengths, weaknesses. Squadron commander looks at him. He goes, okay, next week, I want you guys to tell me how you're going to take the guys in the bottom third and move them up. Yeah. Uh, that's a good, that's a good challenge, right? That's yeah. a good challenge. Like, because when you're on a high performing team like that, you're only as good as the weakest link. Sometimes right. we, all of us have to play together. All that's of right. us are going to go to war together. You can't just put people on the bench for perpetuity. Yeah. You know, somebody's going to get their opportunity and their, their, their time to go do the thing. Mm-hmm. So how do we make them better? How do we improve that overall piece? And so that's one thing that I would say to guys, yeah. if you want to do extra, find a guy in mentor room. Find a guy and help that guy in the bottom third get better and yeah. move him up. I'm, I'm having that same conversation with Capo right now, man. About, I mean, he's he's crushing the PT side of it. He's doing very well, all right? And so far, they, they did a run the other day. There was 150 of them out there. All the ROTC cadets and the whole detachment, all the freshmen, they're out there running. He finished fourth. That's pretty good, right? You're, you're in the top third as far as, you know, when it comes to physical training. So I told him, I was like, okay, well, go find your flight mates who aren't doing as well and see if they want to go to the gym with you. Yeah, take them to the gym. Guess what that's called? It's called leadership. Yeah, it's leadership. It's called leadership, man. And leadership does not mean standing at the podium uh, with the gavel every day. Leadership does not mean, you know, I'm the boss with the wreath on my name tag. Leadership is helping your bros out, get to that level so that you're, you're not surrounded by a bunch of teammates who are sitting in the ready room that nobody wants to go fly with. Yeah. All right. Get those guys up, help them out, man. Go 
if there's, if you know that a kid is struggling in something and you're doing well in something, you can go and offer him, hey, man, why don't you tag along with me for a little bit? Well, and here's the example, too. So if you do something like that, don't go tell your boss that you're doing that. Yeah, that's valid. Help yeah. the dude out. Because what's going to happen is if this guy's performance and work starts to improve over time, guess what the boss is going to do? The boss How is going to go. That happen? He's going to go to that guy and go, dude, yeah. what's what changed? And he's going to go, oh well, Roscoe. Yeah, I started working know, out with about guy, yeah. a month ago. Roscoe came to me and asked me if I needed help with anything, and then he started showing me how to do some of the stuff, and so I've started applying yeah. that. And guess what the boss is going to think? Now, now Roscoe holds. Yeah, yeah, so, right. Yeah, now you're in his head. Yeah, exactly. So to speak, all the. All of these things, all of these things all tie together, man. And, and, you know, it's, I think it, while they don't take talent, a lot of these things do take some skill. Yes, they are skills. Um, and, and you have to kind of build on them, right? So you're not going to probably wake up tomorrow morning and execute all of these things on this list that we've been talking about at a very high level. Pick one or two, you know, maybe tomorrow your goal is, man, I'm just going to be a happy person tomorrow. I'm, I'm going to go into work with a good attitude and I'm just going to be happy for a little bit. I'm going to, I'm going to smile. I'm going to shake people's hands and ask them how they're doing. And if you can do that for maybe a week, you'll, you'll find, I think that it makes you feel good about yourself and it really doesn't cost you that much energy yeah. to do that. It's, it's much easier to be happy than it is to be mad. So try these things out a little bit and work on them. You know, if, if you want, uh, if you want more time in your day and more freedom, then have the discipline to get up when your alarm clock goes off. Start your day with a win. You know, my, my, my two things, Katie will tell you this, she laughs at me all the time because I, I like to start my day with two wins. My two wins are when my alarm clock goes off, my feet hit the floor. The second thing is I make my bed. That's two wins. I've already started my day winning. Yeah. I can't remember the last time I got out of bed and didn't make my bed. Same. I just, it makes me feel good. I'm already, it's just, it's become so habitual now that I've start my day with two wins and now the rest of the day's open for me. Yeah. All right, ones. Well, we appreciate you guys. Thanks for listening today. Hope you got something out of the podcast. Uh, I'd like to just remind everybody, we are going to do some more shows where we take questions from listeners. So if you got questions or you got comments or if there's a topic that you'd like us to discuss, please go to the website, b1changeone.com. Email Roscoe and I and uh, give us your inputs. We'll, we'll be glad to take those into consideration as we come up on future episodes. My only other parting shot would be everything that we've talked about today, every single topic, it's in my book, Work Hard, Don't Suck. And I'm not just plugging my book because I need people to go buy my book. But if you want something tangible that you can read and make notes in and have this stuff in written word, not just in a podcast in your ear while you're taking a dump, then you can go and get it. It's it's written down out there. There's a lot of other sources you can check out too, but Work Hard Don't Suck is available on Amazon. Yeah, right on. All right, you guys, have a great day. Be the one. Thanks for flying with the Be One Change One podcast. If you got something out of this show, then be the one and share it in your circles of influence. You can be our wingman through our website at www.b1changeone.com. That's B and the number one, change and the number one, dot com. We invite you to be the one and join our fighter squadron on social media at B1 Change One on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. You can follow us at Paul Roscoe White on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn, as well as Roscoe's website, www.paulroscoewhite.com. You can email us from the website and please leave comments, share, and ask questions, or leave ideas of things you would like to discuss on future podcasts. Most importantly, be the one that helps us win the algorithm by leaving a review on whatever platform you're listening on. Thanks for joining. Until next time, be the one.